Welcome back to our lectures on statistics. The lecture is being delivered for students whose major is foreign language to foreign languages, studying at the Department of English and German Languages. The theme of this lecture is classification of lexical stylistic devices, metaphor, metonymy. The outline, is, the outline of this lecture covers the following points. First of all, we'll consider the notion of lexical stylistic devices. Then we'll discuss classification of lexical stylistic devices. And then in more detail, such stylistic devices as metaphor, namely notion of metaphor, structure of metaphor, and types of metaphor, and metonymy. And we'll conclude the lecture with the um, issue of metaphor versus metonymy. Words in a context may acquire additional lexical meanings not fixed in the dictionaries, what are called contextual meanings. The latter may sometimes deviate from the dictionary meaning to such a degree that the new meaning even becomes the opposite of the primary meaning. What is known in linguistics as transferred meaning is practically the interrelation between two types of lexical meaning, dictionary and contextual. Lexical stylistic device is such type of denoting phenomena that serves to create additional expressive, evaluative, subjective connotations. In fact, we deal with the intended substitution results in a stylistic device called also a trope. Lexical expressive meanings in which a word or word combination is used figuratively are called tropes. The majority of linguists agree that a word is the smallest unit, being able to create images, because it conveys the artistic reality and image. On this level, the creation of images is the result of the interaction of two meanings, direct and indirect. Well-known known Soviet linguist Gagarin suggests the following classification of lexical stylistic devices. He points out three criteria, the interaction of different types of lexical meaning within which he uh, highlights the interaction of primary dictionary and contextual imposed meanings. Here he uh, suggests metaphor, metonymy, and irony. The interaction of primary and derivative logical meanings. To this group belong Zygma and Pan the interaction of logical and emotive meanings, interjections and excla exclamatory words, epithet and epsimoron are in this group, and the interaction of logical and nominative meaning. This is antonomasia. The next feature is the intensification of a feature. And he includes the following stylistic devices here, such as simile, hyperbole, periphrasis, euphemism. And in the group of the criteria of peculiar use of set expression, we can point out cliches, proverbs and sayings, quotations and allusion. If we speak about the first criterion in the classification of lexical stylistic devices, and exactly, namely, the first subpoint that is the interaction of primary dictionary and contextual imposed meanings. The interaction or interplaying between the primary dictionary meaning, that is the meaning which is registered in the language code as an easily recognized sign for an abstract notion designating a certain phenomenon or object, and a meaning which is imposed on a word by a microcontext may be maintained along different lines. The first line is when the author identifies two objects which have nothing in common, but in which he subjectively sees a function or a property through which the reader may perceive these two objects as identical. And this is metaphor. The second line is when the author finds it possible to substitute one object for another on the ground of interdependence or interrelation between the corresponding objects. And this is metonymy. And the third line 
is when a certain property or quality of an object is used in an opposite or contradictory sense. And this is irony. It is quite natural that we begin our study of lexical stylistic devices with metaphor, since it is usually regarded as a central trope. It has come to mean different things to different people, so much that specialists in the area are often temporarily confounded when asked for a definition of metaphor. Some people think of metaphors as nothing more than the sweet stuff of songs and poems. But in fact, all of us speak and write and think in metaphors every day. They can't be avoided. Metaphors are built right into our language. Metaphor is probably the most fertile power possessed by man. It's a Greek word meaning to transfer or carry across. Indeed, metaphors carry meaning from one word, image, or idea to another. According to Michael McGlone, metaphor challenges definition for at least two reasons. First, the term is used in several different, albeit related, senses. Second, both within and between its different senses, Definitions vary to reflect sharply different theoretical agendas and assumptions. Sometimes the theoretical boundaries coincide with scholarly disciplines. Thus, philosophers, linguists, and psychologists might each define metaphor in their own terms. Metaphor is most frequently used and at the same time most elaborated stylistic device. Dictionary entries for the term metaphor provide illustrative examples of how metaphor can be variously defined. The two major senses of the term are captured in the Oxford English Dictionary. The first sense identifies metaphor as a type of language, a figure of speech in which a name or descriptive word or phrase is transferred to an object or action different from, but analogous to, that to which it is literally applicable. An instance of this is a metaphorical expression. Thus, metaphor is language that directly compares seemingly unrelated subjects. It is a figure of speech that compares two or more things not using like or as. In the simplest case, this takes the form. The first subject is a second subject. More generally, a metaphor is a rhetorical trope that describes the first subject as being or equal to a second, subject, second object in some way. Thus, the first subject can be economically described because implicit and explicit attributes from the second subject are used to enhance the description of the first. This device is known for usage in literature, especially in poetry, where, with few words, emotions and associations from one context are associated with objects and entities in a different context. In a simpler definition, it is comparing two things without using the words like or as. The second sense identifies metaphor as a form of conceptual representation. A thing considered as representative of some other, usually abstract, thing, a symbol. Now let's speak a little bit about the structure of metaphor. The metaphor, according to Richards in the philosophy of rhetoric, consists of two parts, the tenor and vehicle. The tenor is the subject to which attributes are ascribed. The vehicle is the subject from which the attributes are borrowed. Other writers employ the general terms ground and figure to denote what Richards identifies as the tenor and vehicle. 
Let's consider the following words by William Shakespeare. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. In this example, the world is compared to a stage, the aim being to describe the world by taking well-known attributes from the stage. In this case, the world is the tenor, and the stage is the vehicle. Or we, we, we can consider the following simple example. My love is a violet. My love, tenor, is coupling verb, violet, vehicle. This is the conventional model for the metaphor. It is called subject-object metaphor. We have a tenor or central subject that is described or carried by the vehicle. The basic metaphor is a correspondence such as a equals B, whereas the basic simile is a correspondence such that A is like B. Besides so-called conventional metaphors, they can fall into many different types. Some linguists classify metaphors according to the parts of speech, and they point out such types of metaphors as prepositional metaphors, possessive noun metaphors, adjectival metaphors, for example, Mary is a withered violet in the cool bleak autumn. Or adverbal metaphors, for instance, he walked away sheepishly, which means he walked away like a sheep. Or verbal metaphors, for example, the time was bleeding. But we are more interested in a different type of metaphors. Dead or trite metaphors are also known as cliches. When an image or metaphor has been used so much that it loses its freshness, it's essentially dead. Many of them die because we use them so frequently. The examples of the trite metaphors are the well-known uh, lines from R Robert Burns' poem My love is like a red, red rose or the example that has been mentioned uh, before uh, from Shakespeare's tragedy, tragedy Hamlet, all the world's a stage. Trite or dead metaphors are usually used in newspaper articles, sometimes even in scientific language, but rarely in poetry and prose. Metaphors which are absolutely unexpected that is a quite unpredictable are called genian metaphors. Here we can see some of them. She has all the fragrance and freedom of a flower. There is ripple after ripple of sunlight in her hair. She has the fascinating tyranny of youth and the astonishing courage of innocence. Or another example is through the open window the dust danced and was golden. In genuine metaphors, the image is always present and the transference of meaning is actually felt. These metaphors have a radiating force. The whole sentence becomes metaphoric. The next type is sustained or prolonged metaphors. Trite metaphors are sometimes injected with new vigor. Their primary meaning is re-established alongside the new derivative meaning. This is done by supplying the central image created by the metaphor with additional words bearing some reference to the main word. For instance, Mr. Pickwick bottled up his vengeance and cocked it down. The verb to bottle up is explained as to keep in check, to conceal, to restrain, to repress. So the metaphor can be hardly felt, but it is revived by the direct meaning of the verb to cock down. Such metaphors are called sustained or prolonged. Stylistic function of a metaphor is to make the description concrete to express the individual attitude. The next stylistic device is metonymy. <coughs> 
Metonymy is a stylistic device in which a thing or concept is not called by its own name, but by the name of something intimately associated with that thing or concept. Here are some broad kinds of relationships where metonymy is frequently used. Containment. When one thing contains another, it can frequently be used metonymically, as when dish is used to refer not to a plate but to the food it contains, or as when the name of a building is used to refer to the entity it contains, as when the White House or the Pentagon are used to refer to the U.S. presidential star or the military leadership, respectively. A physical item, place, a body part is used to refer to a related concept such as the bench for the judicial profession, stomach or belly for appetite or hunger, mouth for speech, palate for taste, the altar or the aisle for marriage. Tools or instruments. Often a tool is used to signify the job it does or the person who does the job. For instance, the press, referring to the printing press, or as in the proverb, the pen is mightier than the sword. Product for process. This is a type of metonymy where the product of the activity stands for the activity itself. For example, in the book is moving right along, the book refers to the process of writing or publishing. Punctuation marks often stand metonymically for a meaning expressed by the punctuation mark. For example, he is a big question mark to me, indicates that something is unknown. In the same way, period can be used to emphasize that a point is concluded and not to be challenged or changed. Both metaphor and metonymy involve the substitution of one term for another. They may be used in place of another. However, the two figures of speech work very differently. Metonymy works by the contiguity, association between two concepts, whereas metaphor works by the similarity between them. When people use metonymy, they do not typically wish to transfer qualities from one referent to another, as they do with metaphor. In metaphor, the substitution is based on similarity, while in metonymy, the substitution is based on contiguity. Let's consider the following examples. The example of metaphor. That man is a pig. Using pig instead of unhygienic person. An unhygienic person is like a pig, but there is no contiguity between the two. And the example of metonymy. The White House supports the bill, where we use White House instead of the President. But the President is not like the White House, but there is contiguity between them. That is all in brief concerning the content of this lecture. As a rule, you are suggested to answer these comprehension questions. And as usual, you are giving a list of sources for your further reading. Thank you for your attention.